and that way we can kind of hello everybody welcome to the neo 4 j online meetup um so today we've got we've got three presenters coming all the way from canada we've got mike we've got mark and we've got conrad um so i'll just do a bit of uh, housekeeping for those of you who haven't uh haven't attended one of these before so but uh, most of this is going to be going to be these guys talking and so it, they'll, they'll probably be presenting some slides and there's likely be a bit of code on there so for those you'll want to make sure your resolution is high enough so we go down to the little hd cog in the in the bottom corner and uh, set that to 720p uh, and that's about uh, that's about all you need to do uh, so with that i guess i'll, I'll let uh, i'll let our uh, speakers uh, introduce themselves so maybe you can just uh, each of you quickly say, uh, introduce yourself, what you do, and maybe a sentence or two about how you got into Neo4j and how you've been finding it so far. Yeah, I'm uh, Mike Morley and uh, Conrad and Mark, and we're Menome Technologies, or three people of Menome Technologies. Um, we're really kind of focused on uh, bringing the graph database and doing a lot of uh, uh, narrow search problems as kind of our first uh, main uh, application and product that we put together. Um, I got started with Neo4j back in 2009, actually working on a, a text analytics problem in the domain of trying to extract uh, text from resumes and use it to class, classify um, people with their various skill sets, um, using a bit of topic modeling and, and some things like that. And then since then, I've just really loved being involved and seeing how uh, Neo4j has, has really advanced the whole science and technology around graph databases. And I'm really uh, Looking forward to having a lot of fun with the spatial uh, extension in the near future. Uh, I'll go next. Uh, my name's Conrad. Um, I mostly do DevOps stuff, full stack development, some front end, odd jobs for me now. <laughs> uh, I got started with Neo4j when Mike pulled me in. He needed a developer to build kind of the first version proof of concept of our core product, the link, uh, which is at the time, it was just a rudimentary search engine for Neo4j that allowed you to traverse relationships. I really, really enjoyed working with the graph database, and it's only gotten better since then. So we've been having a lot of fun with it. Uh, I'm Mark. I'm sort of the machine learning influence here. Uh, I started working with Neo4j in university, actually. I did a project on graph databases and uh, found out about Neo4j and then started working with Mike after university, and I was happy to just keep using it. Awesome. Well, it's good, good to have you here again. And obviously, the toques are ready for this very cold weather uh, that we're having. That's right. Canada, yeah. it's always time for toques. <laughs> that's what, that's the first, first lesson of the day. Um, so I, for, I forgot to mention, if you've got any questions uh, that you want, I, I could, I'm watching the YouTube chat uh, if you're watching this live. So if you have any questions that you want to ask the guys, uh, put them on there and I will ask them when I get a bit of a bit of a gap. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to I'm going to hand over hand over to you, Mike, and let you uh, get uh, started with the, with the talk. All right. Yeah, first, we got to get our floppy disk put in. Um... Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's 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 a joke. Bleeding edge, bleeding <laughs> edge technology from Canada. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, today uh, we want to take you through a bit of a story on how we're applying some of the topic modeling stuff and how it relates into the graph and whatnot. And really, this is about trying to um, make it easier for people to tell a story with their data. Um, and what we've actually go through a little bit of history on this. Um, um, there we go. So. I'm dating myself a bit here, and I'm not completely being facetious about the floppy disk. When I started with computers, I actually started on the good old Apple II um, writing bulletin board systems. So back in this time, the whole file management thing was actually a pretty easy thing. You, you know, you'd, Basically, what you'd do is you'd write a program, and you'd put your file on the disk, and you'd give the file a name, and you knew that where that file was. You knew where your data was. It was in that place on that floppy disk. Now, over time, as computers got to be more powerful and applications got to be more sophisticated, uh, we needed to get better ways of managing data. So started to be uh, relational databases started to come into the picture. And what that started to do is um, people became increasingly disconnected from their data. So in most cases, people would be working with their data through the application context. And it was only people who really got into learning the SQL language that would then be able to actually manipulate data directly. Um, you know, fast forward to 2007, now you're starting to see the cloud come into the picture. 
and other types of NoSQL databases. Um, and that further created a big gap, a bigger gap between people. And now most people don't actually know where their data is stored at all. And the only way they can get at it is really through the application. And you have to have a lot of special knowledge to be able to use APIs and to uh, rest and other sorts of things like that to be able to interact directly with data. Um, so what's happened with all of this? And of course, none of the prior paradigms have gone away. We still have data that's being stored in files with things like MS Office and AutoCAD. Um, there's still lots of enterprise databases floating around, ERP systems and Oracle and whatnot in, in corporations. And now you've, you've also got lots of data in the cloud and different cloud hosted systems. Um, and most cloud hosted systems are really like new Lego. You know, you, you basically, when you buy a new Lego kit, you can only make the Millennium Falcon and that's about it. So most uh, cloud hosted enterprise systems, you interact with them the way they want you to. And they don't really give you a lot of direct access to the data. And then a huge twist of irony from my perspective is now there's lots of files being stored in the cloud. So not only have we not gotten rid of files, we've got more files than we have ever had before. So this makes it really tough. Like for people who want to try and uh, work with data, they're having to pull data from a bunch of different places to assemble it all up. And even more than that, this is the typical thing that ends up happening with someone who wants to try and put together a story about data. In fact, yesterday I was just meeting with a, a potential client who is, um, they're doing um, environmental uh, impact assessments for sites, um, contaminated sites and whatnot. And their typical process is they will get, the client will drop a big pile of PDF files on them, and they will have to manually go through and try and extract the files or the data out of those files. So we're going to talk a bit about that and how we're going to try and help with that challenge. Um, so the big question is, you know, and I, I was doing a bunch of research into this to understand this problem. Um, and what I found is if you trace the whole file thing all the way back, like why are files a mechanism for storing data at all? Um, and it comes back to the orig original design of the way the Alto computer was, was envisioned around the desktop metaphor. And the really fun thing is I actually found this uh, reference manual that talks about files and the file storage mechanisms. And right in this reference manual, it actually says, uh, and you can see the quote here, um, facilities for identifying files and finding files are not ideal, but you'll get used to them after the while. After a while, better facilities are the subject uh, for finding files are the subject of research. And of course, as we all know, Steve Jobs kind of showed up at the Xerox lab, thought the desktop thing was awesome, took that and then file and folder metaphors are still the primary way that a lot of our data in, in is stored and managed. So to use a bit of a, an example, and again, this is directly derived from uh, experience, and I've seen this many, many times. So in this case, this the goal here is we want to try and use a hypothetical situation where we are setting up a, a data study to find suitable sites to implement a wildlife con conservation project. Um, so this is to uh, a thing, a study which in which we're going to take a bunch of data and put it together and try and identify several candidate site locations uh, through a bit of spatial analysis and facility design and whatnot. So the typical report assembly process, so the product that comes out of this is generally a, a giant report, a static report. And the way this normally works uh, at most firms is that person or people involved, the team involved with this will go in and they'll, they'll get the big box or the big pile of PDFs, or sometimes they'll even get paper things. They'll go through and they'll try and identify and connect up all the different uh, PDF reports and go through and manually extract the data out of those reports into an Excel spreadsheet. They'll then go through the various enterprise systems by hand, pulling out bits of financial data, trying to find relevant project data, looking for spatial and site data. They'll stick that into their spreadsheet and generate charts and graphs out of that and, and tables and whatnot. Then they'll go and they'll try and find some pictures that represent the, the story that they're trying to tell. They might do an AutoCAD drawing or something to that effect to generate a site plan, a conceptual site model. All of that stuff gets put into a Word document that gets then turned into a PDF that, gets, that then is emailed to the client and also stored in the file store. Now, you can imagine what ends up happening with this if somebody decides, uh, oh, a bit of data has changed or we need to add a new table. You have to go back and redo this whole process. Every single document that's produced in this process or report is custom built. It's a complete custom assembly process. Generally speaking, the processes for creating these things are not documented and not stored and are not reproducible. Um, to put this into a bit of an assembly line metaphor, so where are we in this picture? Um, 
we're back in 1908. So when the car manufacturing process started, uh, it was a whole bunch of single stations and teams of people would go to each station and they would actually build every car from scratch. And then of course, over time, that process has evolved to where now it's quite sophisticated through various steps of automation and robotics and bringing technology into the picture. Manufacturing is now a very sophisticated process in which you can actually construct multiple products from a single assembly line. But with data, we're still stuck back in the station assembly where each data product that is produced is almost always a custom build. So we really like to start, and this is something we've been starting to talk about uh, quite a bit in terms of uh, presentations that we've been doing um, and conceptualizing this a bit more and trying to make it more concrete in that when you think about it, uh, documents and reports and spreadsheets are really dated applications that haven't been written yet. Usually people go to these tools because they're the tools they have at hand. And there isn't really a great way of trying to pull together all of the data and make that easy and re uh, repeatable. Um, so what we're really trying to do is we're, we're trying to look for, there's two parts of this. So one is um, making it easier for people to produce the things, the data, product, uh, data products that they need to produce now, but improving those processes by using a, a lean uh, data value stream analysis approach to figure out which parts of the process we can actually go after now and make better for people. But then ultimately what we really wanna do is get into this idea of helping people create data-driven documents. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, this is an example of a data-driven document on the right-hand side here, uh, this, this graph. So typically the reports that are produced out of these sorts of uh, uh, impact assessments and whatnot are PDFs, big, long documents, lots of words, um, you'll sometimes get graphs and pictures in them, but they are static. Um, I have a colleague from uh, Italy, actually, who was, I was just visiting uh, last week, um, who's doing a bunch of work with the Golder Media Lab in which they are actively trying to move towards data-driven documents, creating interactive portals, graphs and re reports and statistics and whatnot that are still connected to the original data source. Now, it still takes them a lot of work to do this, but the impact is significant in terms of stakeholders being able to really see and get a much better idea and a much cleaner communication about what is actually going on rather than trying to understand and read through a bunch of text. In addition to that, another bit of value that comes out of this is the fact that the data can be used for other things. Plus, if new data comes into the picture, they can very quickly add that into this. Um, so this really is kind of at the heart of what we're up to with a lot of this stuff is uh, trying to understand from a value stream analysis per perspective the story that people are trying to tell. What are you trying to accomplish th with the data? What data products are you trying to produce? Then going back and looking at where the data sources are and figuring out how to automate parts of the extraction process. And Mark's going to talk a bit about this in terms of multi-agent systems and the data bots um, and how those come together. And then a huge part of this and what we're going to focus on uh, towards today with the little demo and some of the talks on uh, machine learning and the file processing aspect is how do we solve the problem of all of the legacy PDFs, files, and documents that are out there that, that people need to get data out of? How can we move towards automatically extracting data, data from old files and reports? Um, and it's a significant challenge. I was uh, in the conversation yesterday as well with this uh, prospective client. They're actually de describing how some consulting firms these days are, are, are actually um, taking screenshots of their tables and putting them in PDFs to try and you know slow the process down of sharing data, which is uh, to me very um, evil. <laughs> that's, yeah, uh, it's it's counterproductive, really. You know, you, you we want data to flow and be available as opposed to be boxed in. Um, so a lot of this is getting into you know we can't jump to data driven documents right away. There's going to be a bit of an evolutionary process to get there. So really what this is about is looking for opportunities to reduce cycle times throughout this data value stream process, figuring out where are the touch points that are burning up lots of time for people. So a lot of this is let's get things set up so we can continuously harvest data from any source. And we talked about that in our last session uh, before Christmas about how we're using these little data bots to automatically and continuously harvest data from the various production systems that a company may have. We then link those data together into key entities, people, projects, clients, files. And this is where Neo4j is an essential element of this story in which 
that's been enabled us to really uh, and awesomely bring data together from many different places in various levels of conformity, but still get all of that stuff in a state that can actually be functional and usable. And then understanding the, uh, the relationships between those data. And then what that lets us do is that kind of gives us a foundation on which we can then bring in the file classification aspect. So the first step with this is we wanna help people out of the giant blob of files that all corporations have in these huge file stores, we wanna help people find the useful files. So not doing a standard search indexing approach, it's going after, hey, we know that these files and uh, are going to be useful to this person at this probability threshold. So um, we start off kind of with a Wikipedia thing in a general classification sense. And then as we get deeper into a corporation's data, we refine those models. And Mark will talk about the, the actual process for doing this um, down to where we can say, yes, this is a high probability that these files are useful geotechnical reports. Yeah. Um, so it's also like an important aside here. We spend a lot of time talking smack about files, but there's something that's not going to go away. Uh, so we talk about we should reduce the creation of new files and all that kind of thing and spreadsheets or applications that haven't been written yet. That's all true, but every time someone has tried to come up with a new catch-all solution to replace files, the the cost of adopting it has been too high and it just ends up being another competing standard. So files exist whether we like it or not and we're trying to make them actually useful and searchable. Yeah, and then the next chunk with that absolutely is going to be looking to try and automate the extraction process out of for, data, for pulling data out of files where possible. Um, so the whole thing kind of looks like this. And as I mentioned in our last uh, presentation we did to the Neo4j community, we talked uh, Conrad and Mark talked quite a bit about the idea of data atoms and how we're uh, continuously harvesting data out of these corporate systems and broadcasting that through a set of data harvesters and then refining that down into Neo4j. Um, today we're going to dive into this whole idea of how do we get files, start to get files into this picture? You know, what does that look like? How are we able to scan through file shares, harvest at least the basic text out of those things where we can, and then link that up to the graph? Hopefully in the future, we will uh, you know, come back and do another uh, session if we're invited to do so on, and once we built it, um, <laughs> augmenting uh, OCR processes with machine learning so that we can have a better chance at extracting data out of, out of, uh, out of files. Um, and then we wanna get work towards this whole idea of, of doing actual data portals and Jupyter notebooks and really get into this, this, this concept of creating data-driven documents. Um, and just as a, a quick case study, we do have this thing uh, running in a, in a early stages at a client in which there's they've got four really large drives of about 120 terabytes a shot. We're assessing some four million, uh, 4 million files through crawling and looking at those things. Out of that, with our current uh, uh, process, we've identified about 70,000 reports that uh, are useful. We still need to go back and refine and do some more training on this to then increase the depth of width which we're classifying things and the accuracy and then expand that scope of crawling to bring in more and link up more reports that have been misclassified by um, or misfiled by people and whatnot. Um, so with that, uh, I will throw this over to Mark. All right, so uh, to talk about the machine learning side of this, uh, as Mike said, we're trying to classify documents that we find on a file drive. Uh, and there's a few ways that we can go about doing this. We can just do base name lookups. We can do anything stochastic. But what we've chosen to do is we're using unsupervised topic modeling to generate uh, unsupervised topics that represent the contents of these files. And as you model the documents, clusters form based on the words that appear in each document. And the more a word appears in a document, the more likely a topic with that word in it is to appear with other topics. So it basically just blows up any set of documents into topics representative of that corpus. Uh, real quick, uh, David Misa from NASA has a good... Mike, maybe you can talk about this a little bit, actually. Cause... Oh, well, yeah, this is a... Uh... A case obviously known, uh, and it's been great speaking with David Misa at the Craft Connect conference as well on this subject. Um, lots of great insight here in terms of uh, the processes that NASA are using uh, to extract um, 
and, and classify lessons learned with a topic modeling process. And there's some really good references. We just wanted to call this out um, because we have used uh, uh, this insight in the process that we've been constructing as well. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, another one thing about AI is that it's not magic. Most of you probably know this, but you can't expect it to work all the time. And if you give it crappy data, it's going to give you crappy results. Yeah, and for the most part, we're trying to emulate sort of how humans interact with things when we use artificial intelligence. And that means that usually our upper bound is the proficiency level of a human. And in the case of file stores, a lot of our problems come from human error. So it's still a little bit nebulous and not a perfect solution. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so another thing about these files is that the information that lives in them is really just lost to the void. If you have a design document that talks about building a specific type of building, you can have all sorts of information sitting in there talking about why they made specific, specific decisions, but it's just sitting there on a drive. The data in there is really just lost to you. So what we want to do is we want to find this data that doesn't really live anywhere, and we want to give it a home. So for example, if someone builds a building and they write a report on how they built the trusts for the parking lot or something like that, if you have that report, you can go in and you can read all of their notes, and you'll figure out what they went through and what they thought it was important for you to know. But that's not always enough. If you need to go deeper, the real information that you want is located in the person's head that wrote that report. And that's the end goal here is to connect that value from that information to where it's needed. The files are just sort of an intermediate step for where that information lives. So real quick, how we're monitoring all of this and harvesting it is we use multi-agent systems. And every human, animal, everything, microservice, all of them can be considered an agent. If it takes input, produces output, it's an agent. And by using this paradigm, we can organize these agents to describe how an environment functions. So in the example here, you can see how someone would ask for a file request on a website. And this is just like this, this system exists everywhere, not as a multi-agent system. We're just modeling it as one. Yeah. Uh, so this this is kind of our worldview and how we manage complexity. Think of everything as agents with relationships, which actually lends itself to the graph model extremely well. Exactly. It's basically the same worldview, and it's worked extremely well so far. Uh, another important thing to note is in multi-agent systems, a multi-agent system can be represented as an agent as well. You can have recursive levels on here. So the complexity is, it really just expands infinitely. Um, additionally, uh, we can have emergent effects happen from having agents interact together. So really cool stuff happens. Uh, we're not playing around with that too much yet, but we'd love to. Okay, so this is, this is the big map of how our harvest works here. So we've got file shares on the left, and we've got these file crawler agents that sit on a file drive and they just look at files and pass some metadata up to uh, our RabbitMQ exchange, which is this big ring road here. Uh, we have a PDF processing bot or agent that reads those messages off of the bus and it extracts the text and uh, indexes it, thumbnails, all sorts of stuff like that. We've got a classification bot that does the probabilistic topic modeling I mentioned earlier. and with this pattern, you can expand it with other bots too. That's the, that's the point is that we can just keep expanding this. Every time we want to include something new, we can just put another bot in. So this only shows two bots here. At the end of the talk, when we get to our demo, we're going to show the third bot that we've made here, which is the clustering bot. Uh, uh, another important thing is that people add value to your company, not software. So if you replace a person with a machine, you've cut overhead for your company, but you haven't created the ability for your company to expand other than the fact that it's reduced overhead. Um, so yeah, what we wanna do there is augment augment people's capabilities by taking it, like in the case of the, like to use this statistics case as an example, instead of having all of our high value statisticians and, and experts in, the, in field uh, data and whatnot spend their time 
mining data out of files, we can replace those low value functions with the Siri by modeling those processes using the multi-agent approach and then automate the bits of those things that are unpleasant and no fun. So then the, the, the people who are doing the data related work can focus on the really high value stuff. Mm -hmm. So basically our goal with all of this is to find out where the value that a company has in these files lives and bring it back to where it's needed in the company. So I think we're gonna get into our demo here. Jump to demo later. Um, so I'll just give you an overview here real quick. We've got our stack running on the computer here. Uh, you can see RabbitMQ here is our message bus. And then you see this thing, the FSS here, that acts as our PDF processing bot. So and what, describe what happens in that. So uh, what happens with the FSS is when a file is dropped in to Minio, which is our file store here. Yeah, Minio is an open source uh, Amazon S3 compliant API surface uh, that turns um, basically any kind of uh, storage device into an Amazon S3 like drive. So what what will happen here is if I drop a file in Minio. Are you able uh, to zoom that in a little bit? Pardon Sorry? me? Are you able to zoom it in? Make the oh. text a bit bigger. Uh, you could, can, yeah, I think it's Command Plus, isn't it? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So what will happen here is we'll drop a file into Minio, and our Minio harvester will kick uh, an event out on the Rabbit bus, and the FSS will pick that up. Uh, the FSS will extract some full text and add that to the node in Neo4j. And then the uh, topic modeler will pick up the message that it kicks out onto Rabbit, and it'll realize that there's full text available in the graph. So it'll ingest that and model it with the unsupervised topic modeling, and it'll give us some topics. Yeah, and FSS stands for File Synchronization Service. So it's what we use to keep the graph in sync with our file store contents. Mm -hmm. Let's give it a go here. Kick it over so you can see it. Okay, so here we see, so you can see that we got a new one here and we type the thumbnail extraction, text extraction, check some uh, full text. We do a corruption check in there as well. Yeah, so currently the text extraction process, like, that's another thing that's really nice about uh, multi-agent systems is we can kind of start off with a, an initial process. So right now, the goal of the process that we focused on is the find and discover process. So automatically classifying documents using the topic modeling uh, and, then, and then linking them up to uh, associated topic nodes and other things so that people can find those things more easily. Um, and we're generating a thumbnail out of that. Right now, there's not uh, an OCR piece that exists in that chain. Well, there is. It just hasn't been trained, and it gives not very good results. <laughs> right. So that thing is still pretty simple. The goal with this, though, is um, over time to start to evolve those types of um, you know, those parts of the bots to improve at each step um, the ability of the OCR to recognize things better and better. And we, it's going to be kind of an iterative process, and we may add more of these agents into the stream uh, to then start to pick up and improve the different parts. And we may also start to split the bots up so that there's one that, you know, let's say there's a different processing chain that's needed for Word documents as opposed to CAD drawings, as opposed to Excel spreadsheets. Uh, right now, we're just using the one uh, file sync service to generate all of, extract all of the content from those types. Um, as we start to discover and differentiate the processes associated with the different document types, we'll be able to start to break those things up into smaller components that will be specialized uh, around the those uh, actual um, specific document types and whatnot. Yeah, we've actually written up a conceptual model for how that works, and it's so far implementation is pretty solid. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to add that with containerization software like Docker and Kubernetes, it perfectly aligns with this multi-agent system paradigm, so it's a very easy way to organize containers. Yeah, so this uh, PDF file you uploaded, this Turtle Mountain Stability. Oh yeah, we should mention what Turtle Mountain is. So Turtle Mountain is, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, we chose that one deliberately. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to demonstrate the classification of a particular type of file, in this case, a geotechnical report. Um, but we don't know it's a geotechnical yeah. report yet. We don't know it's a geotechnical report yet. Sorry, that's true. I'm, I'm, yeah. I, I just saw Mike madly Googling for like public <laughs> design documents for 
um, buildings and stuff. So yeah, yeah. So and Turtle Mountain, what that is, is it's a it's a major it was a major landslide that happened uh, at the turn of the century, just down the the road from where we live here in Alberta, in, in a small town called Frank. Yeah, and uh, it, it obliterated a village. Um, Smaller town. Yeah, and but that the mountain there is actually still seismically uh, active. So there's continuous monitoring going on on that particular mountain. Um, and so there's a number of studies that have been done on it. So we want to see now, let's, you know, if we were trolling around through a company's uh, file drive, could we pick that thing out as actually being a geotechnical report? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And although we know about the file is where it sits on the drive and what its bytes are. Okay. So we got this file off the drive and we've got the full text up here and we sent it over the topic modeler and you can see it modeled the document and it published the message. So if we look here in the graph, We'll be able reload to that. reload this. There we are. And if we expand the relationships out I'm here. sure that the text is in there and all that stuff. Uh, can we make this bigger? Yeah, we should zoom that in. Uh, control plus, I think, is the key there as well. Or command plus, sorry. There you go. Yeah, yeah sure. sure. OK. You can see what we're doing there is we're actually extracting all of the text out of the file. Um, we're not doing any breaking up of the text further at this juncture. Not not before it goes into the graph, but the topic modeler does cut this up its own way. Yeah. One of the things we're considering doing is uh, is getting further into this by breaking the, the text up into a subgraph, but um, we haven't done a lot of experimenting with that yet. Okay, so what did this get classified as? Let's take a look. So these red Almost nodes are topic nodes? There. Are... Um, what, what algorithm do you use to extract the topics that you have there? So we use a Python library called GenSim, and we're using LDA topic modeling. OK, cool. And our corpus, like our training set. Uh, right. Uh, so originally, we started with the Wikipedia model that GenSim has for their website's demo and everything. And we generated 100 topics from Wikipedia. We then classified all of the corporate files against that from this particular company's file drive. And then we took the files that we ingested that were related to things that we were interested in. So we just we just took a base cut line from the Wikipedia corpus. And then we took those files and we generated a more restricted domain corpus for the company's vertical. Uh, so that's why all of these topics here pertain to yeah, and the, the other part of the equation that, that falls into this is um, what we did is we had, uh, um, uh, there's, there's kind of a few manual steps in terms of the training aspect. One was um, we used a, a co-op student. Who, <laughs> an agent in our system. An agent yes. in our system, yeah. We, so we modeled the, uh, the manual training process using a co-op student who uh, dutifully went through the drive finding actual examples of specific types of reports for us. Um, that we then use to train up a, a more a more granular model. Um, the other thing that we did is we also, you know, some of the files are named correctly. So some of them actually do have the word geotechnical in the file name or somewhere on the path. Um, so we could then also further extend the modeling aspect by just using simple regex technique, techniques and whatnot as we scan through the file drives, looking for those sorts of signals. But some of them are also called things like geotechnical. Mm -hmm. So it, yes, you can only rely on that so much. This yeah, is so. also a, a recursive process. Every time we update the corpus, we look at it and we go, oh, we should fix this and change these words. So it's something that changes over time too. Yeah. So yeah, and the, the initial thing is classifying stuff, but the next phase of this gets into actually firing the documents through mm -hmm. the judge bot to act as a filter to determine whether or not something is of said thing. Yeah, so real quick before we get into that okay, here. sorry. Uh, you can see that it's it's been modeled into all of these topics, and each of these relationships has a weight value associated with it. Our topics don't have explicit names when we generate them. We no. just name them based on what the five most common words. Yeah, it's it's just a pile of words. Um, so as you can see, it's got a tw uh, 0.28 affinity to this one here, which has site geotechnical in it, which makes sense. 0.28 is actually pretty high. That's pretty high. That's good. Uh, so we've got this, and we've got these unsupervised topics here. But what we would really like to be able to do is have supervised topics. So we can say geotechnical reports, uh, structural design reports. Give me those. Can so I can I ask some other uh, questions before we go on to the next bit? Yeah, of so course. Yeah. Question number one is: How do you decide 
uh, how many topics you were going to do in that initial uh, training. You said you did 100. How did you decide 100? Uh, originally, we, well, with the Wikipedia corpus, I tried a couple different things. And like when I tried 10, it was obvious that that was not enough because, like, well, one, 10 topics for Wikipedia, but two, you'd have a topic about American politics and Chinese basketball teams or something like that. So, you, so do you just judge like the topics that it comes up with by eye, just by like looking at? Uh, we know, have a... also, an, I believe there's a hierarchical LDA algorithm that generates uh, an optimal number of topics, uh, but that one oh, is, I see. Okay. It's a lot newer. I've only read a couple papers about it. Um, I'm curious what they mean by optimal. Yeah, it's it uses word bound very uh, anyways, but yeah, just <laughs> trial and error is easiest, or or try out the HLDA algorithm. Yeah, we did actually do a statistical study at, uh, a number of years ago when I first was experimenting with this in the context of the resume model, um, and we found in in, in yeah, as Marcus said, you know, with a, a broader case like Wikipedia, you're better off with more topics. Narrower case, um, and you can correct me if I get this wrong, but it, mm -hmm. uh, according to that study anyway, you'd reduce the number of topics as you're getting more specific about the classification. So I think for, for things like if we're classifying specifically into the geotechnical uh, document subset, we would be inclined to use fewer topics mm -hmm. um, and reduce that down a bit. To well, potentially. It dep it, like there's, you need to think about scope and breadth, because if, if scope is how much how wide the the topic base is of the files then so say you, you say you have files that talk about art and they're talking about sculpting and painting and stuff but they've only got one file for each different type of art so they've got a file for painting a file for sculpting a file for drawing uh, if you have five topics in something like that that's only got five different areas it might work out all right, but if you've got a hundred different documents that talk about all of them and they talk about art and sculpting together and the, the similarities between them, then that's going to create another area for a topic to form. So re really just trial and error is the big thing. And the, uh, the other important thing is stop words. Uh, when you're generating these topics, you define a list of words that you just don't model. Uh, updating that list is very important. Keep making sure that you have good stop words is vital. Yeah, yeah, and the stop words are actually, that's a really good point, actually, because, of course, as you get in, each organization is a bit different in terms of what constitutes stop words, because mm -hmm. uh, the client names will be different, the uh, you know the domain that the organization works in is a bit different, and that's actually something, you know, in, in, in the case of um, when we're competing against things, and we get asked this question quite a bit, well, how can you compete against things like, you know, Google's machine learning thing or, or Azure or whatever, um, and that is actually a big differentiator is we we can get into being very specific about an organization's domain um, where those other larger companies are going to have a harder time doing that, at least at, at this juncture, um, because they're just not going to be able to uh, have people on the ground who can understand the world of geotechnical reports and site studies. Um, and it's not cost effective for them a lot of the time. No, they could go deep into these verticals, but it's not as profitable as being a global search engine. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that's cool. Yeah. And then the second question I had was, in the context of of topic modeling, what what's the difference between unsupervised and supervised topic modeling? And okay, so topic? Uh, those are general learning terms. Uh, supervised learning is when you you provide feedback that says yes, that is what I want you to learn. So if we were generating supervised topics from this, we would be saying geotechnical is a topic. Structural design is a topic, uh, culture is a topic, and then every, when we train the machine, we would say based on these topics and the files, match them up so that I have a group of files that looks like geotechnical reports, I have a group of files that looks like structural design reports, and based on the fact that they're two distinct groups, I know they're separate. Unsupervised is when you say I have this list of documents and a document is just a list of words and I want to I want to generate topics I don't care what they're about I don't care what they say I just want you to go into the documents and without my feedback come up with your own topics. come up with your own topics all right cool thanks all right cool so the next part that we're going to talk about here is putting supervised learning on top of this because we've got 
unsupervised topics here, and we want to be able to say, this is a geotechnical report over here. So if I take you into this boy here, let's make that bigger. That's probably good. <laughs> giant code okay so a little bit of a hack job right now but <laughs> uh yeah so we, we've got this giant list of different different topics and we've got a bunch of documents that we've modeled against these topics so we can ask the we can ask the graph give me every document that i know is a geotechnical report thanks to our summer student or our co-op student <laughs> and Based on those, give me a, a phenotype for what that report's weight values look like. So in the model we're using, we have 40 topics. And see geotechnical reports here. The I believe that's the seventh topic. Uh, most geotechnical reports have an affinity for the seventh topic. They all, most of them have a huge affinity for, uh, I believe that's the 35th topic there. And this is very different for other reports, so you can see Technical design reports have their own distribution. And, and we don't and, really prescribe this. This is just, we know these are geotechnical reports. What do they usually get classified as? Yeah. It's like a fingerprint. Yeah. Basically, it's a phenotype. A phenotype. So what we can do then is we can take uh, a document's topics, and we can go, these are your topic distribution, and we have our ideal topic distribution compute the Cartesian distance between them and give us the closest one. So basically, it's just the nearest neighbor rule. And if we run through that, going to get that Hall of Mirrors effect. Oh, God. Hello. If we run through, sorry, let me find what I'm looking for here. Postman. OK. Hi. There he is. How do people use Max? Yeah, OK. So <laughs> our. Our bot pattern works in two ways. It communicates over the rapid bus, and then it also communicates with webhooks. So uh, we've got a front end endpoint on it where we can paste it a UID for a node in the graph here, and it will model that node against the phenotypes we have to give us the prescribed supervised topic. So let's send that off. And it'll go judging. And then if we refresh this, and then we expand that out. Oh, God. No, it's in the other. Is it yeah. in the other one? Is it in the other one? No, I believe it's in this one. We might have hooked it up to the wrong one. Okay, so what should happen? OK, so what should happen <laughs> is this should uh, this should be linked up to a green node called geotechnical reports. Try clopping out the other, the other new 4J instance. This one? Yeah, just click on that, see if it. That guy's not connected to anything, huh? No. Uh, well, he doesn't have topics. So. No, he does. Yeah, you're. It, it'd be this one. I. We're juggling the O4J mm -hmm. instances. Thread. Interesting. Uh oh, but well, we have demo, demo dance going yeah, on here. Yeah, sorry guys. Yeah. Uh, oh, while you while you look. Look, fixing the demo, I'll try, I'll try to fix it. At least we've got a question, another question for maybe one of the others. Uh, how do you do, how do you handle nearest neighbors on uh, large data sets? Uh, on lo what do you mean by large data sets? Uh, presumably means like lots of documents, I guess. Lots of documents. Well, okay, so the, the limiting factor is the number of topics that happen. So every document that's modeled. Uh, when we record it in the graph, we only record the top five highest links, but every document does have a complete set of 40 weight values to each topic. And we've just truncated these down to the top five just to make it the same. Um, and basically what we do is we take uh, a list of 40 weight values for the topic and we just we just compute the, diff the distance between each dimension and then total them up. Yeah, and there's also sort of a cutoff point. So if you ingest a document, you have whatever phenotypes that you've identified and you want to, in a supervised way, classify documents as, and this document gets modeled and it's nothing like any of your defined phenotypes, then it doesn't get linked up to any phenotype. 
And so with this approach that you're describing, does it work? So this, the, the second part of the question was like the large data sets means millions or billions of documents. Have you? I don't know if we've ran into any complications based on the largeness of data sets. Because for a while we had like 4 million files in here. Uh -huh. And Neo4j is pretty good at handling stuff that's that big or bigger. So the big thing is making sure that your phenotypes are generated from clean. There we go. Oh, you said the wrong UID. OK, yeah, I was pasting in the wrong UID there. But yeah, I mean, the data sets, just to answer that question a bit more, like typically at corporate data sets, you're looking in you know, the, the tens of millions of files and whatnot, as opposed to hundreds of millions or you know, that kind of thing. Um, so it actually isn't necessarily, you know, big data is kind of a relative thing in that sense. Um, and as Conrad has said, you know, so far, I think the graph database for the, the one of the clients we're doing a bunch of work with, the, one I, the case I'd cited earlier, um, I think that is running about uh, 10 million, roughly 10 million nodes. Uh, and as I understand it, that's a fairly small set, relatively yeah. speaking, for Neo4j. The other thing is most of this topic modeling and phenotype classification and stuff it does not scale based on the total number of files in the graph no the the, the issues you're going to run into there are the same with any machine learning problem if your application set outgrows your training set by orders of magnitude then your training set starts to not become representative of what you think it represents yeah but if you have yeah. your corpus already made and you classify a file and you assign it uh, a document type you're not querying over every file in the database. Mm -hmm. It's very much this one file, these like 40 topics, and these five phenotypes. Mm -hmm. And so no matter how many files you ingest, it doesn't slow the system down for classifying a single one. No, and we could, we've got the thing set up so we can swarm parts of it too in terms of the containerization mm -hmm. multi-agent system approach. So um, there, there are mechanisms we can bring into play there as well in terms of uh, scaling things up if we're ingesting a large volume of files from a number of different crawler sources. Um, yeah, we actually got this to work. So what it was is we had, mm -hmm. uh, because we generated a new node, of course, it gave it a new ID, which we were pasting in an old ID. Yeah. <laughs> so now you can see the geotechnical reports and off we go. Uh, and I, I suppose I could show you real quick here to uh, the nearest neighbor computations. These are just the values that it puts out and we take the smallest one. So. TD report and geotechnical report, you can see they almost tied. And if you were to look through the phenotypes here for TD and geotechnical report, you would see that they're very, very similar. Um, so that's that's an indication that we need to clean up our phenotype data set a little bit there. Yeah. And the intent with this is, uh, is as the crawlers are blasting through, so the typically engineering firms and consultancies that live in this world, um, they, they will use a file naming convention. Um, to try and store, uh, you know, organize their file stores. Um, they'll try. They'll, they'll try. Do their best. Reality is never that clean. Um, so certainly what ends up happening is you'll get a large uh, devi set of deviations around the way file names are applied, the places where people store and describe their data and whatnot. Um, so this type of an approach um, is really going to help us out in terms of finding and identifying uh, files that are not classified or, or filed using the standard conventions. Um, the other thing we're looking at doing as well is uh, trying to come up with a phenotype pattern to identify uh, and differentiate between drafts and prior versions versus final versions. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of signals that we started to be able to identify that differentiate saying, yeah, this report's actually the final report versus the other 52 of these things that are prior iterations of this thing. And then you get into duplicate detection as well. And that's that's another thing to tackle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there notes off of this? Or... Pardon me? Uh, it should I just be the topic. So. So. You're not attached. Oh, look at that. Oh, there's a thingy there. There's another one. Oh, no, that's, a, that is. that's an error. Oh, that's probably prior. Yeah. That's probably been in there a while. So um, the other thing that we just kind of wanted to say as we approached the end here was uh, you know, we, we did do a fairly, um, we want to obviously take questions or more of those. Um, we do, we do get asked a lot when we're doing these sorts of presentations about the, uh, the validity of an application of the blockchain. Um, and we, we definitely wanted to make a statement about this whole blockchain thing and, and how important and, and you know, valuable it is. So what we did is we Especially did Especially in the world of data. Yeah, yeah, in the world of data and, and, and whatnot. So 
We did a detailed analysis of this and we've come up with a comprehensive flowchart that describes everything you need to know about blockchain in this, this particular world. Um, questions? Questions? <laughs> All right, I'm watching. I'm watching to see if anyone else has any, uh, any further questions for you. <laughs> um, so is your is your plan still that you would store the full text stuff in Neo4j as well, or would you uh, really only or likely that's just what you're doing at the moment, and you'd probably store that text that text is elsewhere, and you just store the topics that you've pulled out in Neo4j, or what's the? Um, we're we're plan? still storing the text in, in Neo4j right now, and there, there's a couple of reasons we're doing that. Um, one is we're not 100% sure, you know, what other downstream things we're going to do with this. So. Because Neo4j also has the Lucene engine uh, in it, uh, we're actually using the full text and injecting it in through the APOC side and full text indexing it. So we get benefits out of that in terms of allowing people to be able to do, you know, full text to graph queries on for identifying and locating uh, files, and then they can find projects associated with those files or people associated with those files and so on. So there's actually quite a bit of value in us leaving the text in Neo4j itself. Um, it also has not really caused us much performance overhead. No. Like queries have not gotten slower since we've ingested just a ton of full text. I mean, stuff just hmm. keeps faster because you guys keep making Neo4j faster. So <laughs> thank you for that, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. You're <laughs> outpacing our terrible development practices. Yeah. Um, the, other thing that we're, yeah the other thing that we're also doing with the full text is, and again, the, this is where the Lucene engine is quite useful. Um, because we've got node lists of all the clients and all of the people who work at the company and these other things, a lot of times it's very difficult just by looking at the file name. Uh, people almost never, never fill out the file properties, so those are almost useless. Um, but we can direct the full text search at the full, uh, sorry, the search into the full text, but by taking people's names and then iterating that through the full text engine, get reports back that correspond to those people's names and then generate actually this relationships associated with this person's probably an author of this document. Yeah, or even show me all of the reports that I'm named in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's lots of additional value that we're finding out of keeping the text in Neo4j actually. Okay. And so do you, uh, can we just loop back to some of the stuff you talked about the middle at the beginning? So now, so people can can uh, can hook it all together. Um, so what what would you you explained at the beginning some of the use cases for where you could use this uh, approach? So maybe we can just remind people um, what those were. Yeah. So the, the 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 there's a couple. It goes in it goes in layers. I'm just trying to get back to the, the one slide here. So the main use case for this is um, all companies have lots of data. Um, in lots of places. In lots of places. So really what we want to try and get to is, is a place where it's, it's, we want to make it much easier for people to actually work with the data that they've got, uh, they've got access to and take out wherever we can, reduce the manual processes involved with people having to assemble data together. Um, so the first thing is being able to find and discover things. Okay, I, I can now go and I can find all the projects and all the reports. Um, and the people associated with a particular project. So this is the idea that, you know, our first product coming out of the gate is really about helping companies tell the story of the work that they do. So um, what are all the things that went into the decisions and the uh, reports and designs that went into making a building? Or what are all the things that happened on this oil and gas site? You know, there was a, um, who are all the people who contributed to this outcome? That kind of a use case. Um, that is really all about uh, harvesting data from the enterprise systems, which was this, this guy up here, and then tying and pulling in and classifying automatically all of the files, and then making that available through a, a search engine user interface. Uh, moving forward, the next step with that, we then want to start to enable people to get access and to actually be able to leverage the data in here that we're assembling in Neo4j to create uh, data products. So instead of somebody having to go through this whole horrible manual process that I described uh, earlier, I don't know if there's a way to jump directly to a slide on this thing. But, um, okay. Whoa. <laughs> that worked. Um, so instead of having to go through this horrible uh, process of, uh, as I was describing from our, our um, the, the people we were meeting with yesterday, um, the environmental uh, scientists who, Literally, their client walks in, drops a terabyte drive of 
PDF files and other sorts of semi-structured and structured data. And they have to go through this whole manual process of then building a picture and assembling all the data together and linking it all up before they can even start to work on the actual problem. Um, so we're looking very much to try and automate uh, portions of this, again, with the goal of working towards being able to um, provide data to people so that they can actually get to a state where they can create data-driven documents as opposed to static files and reports. Cool, cool, yeah, hopefully that answered the, the question. Um, so yeah, I guess before we wrap up, if you, um, those of you are still still watching, don't forget to like the video if you if you enjoyed uh, the talk so that, that more people uh, will be able to, to find it. And if you have any questions that you have uh, afterwards, you can, you can always ask them uh, on the Neo4j Slack channel. So it's neo4j.com forward slash Slack. I guess I can, uh, I can put that in the YouTube uh, chat so you can, uh, you can click to it from, uh, from there. I'm gonna give people a few minutes if they have any uh, extra questions, but, but I guess they've had, a, they've had a lot of time to ask them. So I'm gonna assume that you've, uh, you've done a great job of, of answering everything. Um, so if people were to want to try and do this stuff themselves, where, where would you su suggest is the best place for them to start? Would you, is it like from the Jensen website, do you have something that you've written up showing how you glue the tools together or what would you, what would you Jensen advise? Jensen has a really good tutorial set up on their website where you ingest Wikipedia and break that up into topics. Uh, Certainly David Mises. Uh, so David yeah, Mises went right. uh, He's got the code, the source code from that uh, uh, published on um, on his uh, GitHub repo. Um, that's an R-based approach. Um, so we've gone down a little bit of a different path with it, and we we just basically containerized the the Jensen module and then wired it into this larger processing pipeline. But yeah, as Marcus said, there's you know the the we're just leveraging some more open source code there and putting it into more of a, a pipeline process. So there's not anything we're not doing anything magic. <coughs> That sense, other than just automating it a lot more. Gen Sims Python too, if we didn't say that earlier. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good point. <laughs> uh, a lot of this stuff is lives in the Python domain. Um, Python or R are probably the two main approaches that we've investigated. Um, there are topic classifiers available in Azure and in. Um, Actually, there's a couple on NPM. There's an LDA thing yeah. on M on NPM too, but it's fine. Yeah, the ones we tried out in those aren't that great. The challenge with some of the big cons commercial ones is. Um, you know, they're, they're fairly generic. And in the case of what we're doing with this, we really need to have control over the training process uh, at a fairly granular level. So that's why we went with the, uh, the GenSim approach in this case. Yeah, so running GenSim with whatever corpus and whatever documents you have, and then piping output into the graph mm -hmm. so that you can see how the files relate and which files connected to which topics. You kind of build like a tag cloud automatically if you do that, yep. and you can do other analytics down the line. Once it's in the graph, it's very easy to play with. Yeah, I guess I could I could show you. Yeah, let's uh, oh, I flip this here. back to sharing. Yeah, uh, it's, it's all right. It's all right. We've got, we've got to wrap up. But in oh, case, yeah. I've shared I've shared some links to all the things that you talked about. So I've shared some links to uh, David Meza's work and to the the Jensen package as well. So people can can click on those if they if they watch now or, or later on. The the chat stays alongside that. Um, so I guess yeah. I'll say thanks again for uh, for, for presenting to us. It was really interesting hopefully people have got some ideas of some projects that they can go and uh, try out graphs and uh, and text analytics on it's a lot of fun yeah, <laughs> yeah. and we're looking forward to bloom for some of this stuff too that's yeah. gonna be that's gonna awesome. be really to play around yeah. with yeah so that should be out soon and i've put a link to the early access program on the chat as well oh, cool, cool. <laughs> so i guess uh, we'll wrap up so thanks again and um thanks everybody for for, for watching and uh, we're gonna do a and meet up next week, same time, on a World Cup graph that we've created and a GraphQL API we've got on top of uh, uh, on top of that. So I can uh, let me uh, let me share the the link to that as our as our last uh, last thing for uh, for today. And it's coming up. So if you're if you're interested in the World Cup or you just want to see how you build a Neo4j data set, I'll be uh, I'll be uh, going through that. And obviously England are not very good at football, so they tend to lose. Uh, so my colleague Jesus uh, is going to join me, and he's uh, from Spain. And obviously, they are much better at football than England. So we'll at least have someone who's got a, a decent team there.
And I don't know if Canada has a shot. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we, we can't have you guys. <laughs> <laughs> We're <not. laughs> so like oh. ice football or? Yeah, ice, ice football. There we go. Yeah, I have to do ice hockey go off, then you'll be in. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Thanks again. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.